So welcome all. Uh, nice to uh, see you all. <clears throat> and um, you'll be pleased to hear that we're starting a new chapter of Genesis today. We are going to Genesis chapter 4, four. where we find that if you think that things were going badly before, they could get a lot more badly still uh, than that. I don't know. I don't expect that we'll get through the whole chapter but if you do it'll be a bonus if anybody needs to leave in the middle uh just uh if you just just go uh and uh hopefully you'll be able to catch up uh afterwards with whatever you missed so let's uh, begin by asking for god's blessing almighty god our heavenly father as we come together again through our various devices to study your word we pray that you would be with us all wherever we are and bless us with the gifts of your holy spirit that when as we hear and discuss and contemplate your word it would do its powerful work in us to bring about repentance and a living faith in jesus name amen 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 <clears throat> okay <clears throat> At the end of Genesis 3, which was the uh, previous uh, a previous study, we uh, had Adam and Eve cast out of the garden. Uh, cherubim with flaming swords guarding the garden and the and God clothing them with the skins of animals. And now we come to uh, chapter four. And what I would like is uh, is is for us to read uh, uh, all the way from verse one uh, to verse five. So the first paragraph, if you like, first one uh, to verse five of chapter four. Um, whoever gets there first gets to read. I'll do it if you like, Pastor. Thank you. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again she, was, she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a tiller of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the, of the ground, and Abel brought of the first things of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. Thank you <coughs> very much. Um, so we see here that um, the, <clears throat> uh, the procreation, uh, which God both commanded and blessed at creation, uh, begins after the fall um, outside the uh, garden. Uh, we don't know very much at all about the life of Adam and Eve after chapter 3. Very little is said about it uh, at all. Uh, and, um, you know, there's been some, sometimes people have been tempted to speculate about it but uh the bible offers us uh, virtually uh no information other than what we can sort of infer and we can infer a little bit as we will see in just a moment about them uh except this their offspring and this is the important thing about adam and eve and particularly about eve uh you will remember uh, last week when we looked at chapter three that even as God was interrogating <clears throat> Adam and Eve for their disobedience, he already made a promise, and the promise was concerning the seed, the seed of the woman. <clears throat> and so therefore, the line, if you like, the bloodline from Adam and Eve becomes, and I don't think it would be an exaggeration to say, the most important thing in the Bible, in the whole of the Old Testament. I mean, have you ever wondered about why the Bible books of the Bible are so full of lists of names who begat whom? Mm. 
Uh, I remember when I first, I was um, about 15 when I decided that I should start reading the Bible for myself regularly. And somebody told me that if you read three chapters a day, every day, you get through the Bible in roughly a year. So then I sat down and started reading three, three chapters a day. And I read three chapters beginning Genesis 1 um, <clears throat> every day. And when I finished in chapter three, one day I would read four, five and six the next day and so on. And there are a couple of places where I fall, where I where I struggled. Uh, one of them was when one of the three chapters was Psalm 119, with his 176 verses, which <laughs> pretty much took it took it took you know reading another two after that uh, was was hard work. Another one was some of the uh, legislation in Leviticus, particularly, but not only Leviticus reading through three chapters of various regulations concerning sacrifices or or lepros and things for my 15 year old self was a little bit of a struggle at times. <clears throat> and another one that I struggled with was when I when I read at the beginning of one Chronicles. And the first three days of one Chronicles, three chapters a day was just genealogies, lists of who begat whom endlessly. And at the time, part of the struggle was, of course, that a you know, it was bad enough trying to understand and you know, read these Hebrew names. But what on earth was the point of it? Why does the Bible have all this sort of just lists of names and bloodlines? What possible spiritual benefit can I get from reading this? I mean, have you ever read the Bible thinking, well, it's in the Bible, but I can't see how this helps me? I, I expect you have. <clears throat> yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and part of the answer to that, an important part of the answer to that, uh, with re regard to all these genealogies is that the promise is made to Eve and her seed, or as the ESV translates offspring, <coughs> therefore tracing the lineage from Adam and Eve becomes a matter of central importance. I remember years and years ago, I was in a church in an Anglican church in Oxford. And uh, they, the, the sermon text was the first part of the gospel of first, first part of the first chapter of Matthew. Now, who can tell me how the gospel of Matthew begins? Well, you the genealogy. It's the genealogy of Jews, yes. And, and I, I still remember the preacher made the point. He started his sermon by reading some famous openings of books. You know, uh, these were the best of times, they, they were the worst of times, and all uh, various other very famous openings of books. And said, you know, the opening of a book is really, really important for capturing your reader's attention. And then he read through Matthew 1. And that's not how to do it. <laughs> he just gets a list, <laughs> list of names. But of course, Matthew begins with a genealogy because it's he traces the lineage of Jesus to the promises, in his case, to Abraham. Luke in his gospel traces the lineage of Jesus all the way to Adam. Which is why by the time we get to chapter five, which is the next chapter, <clears throat> having chapter two began of the just a verse uh, halfway through verse four, chapter two said, the, you know, these these are the generations of the heavens and the earth. And then chapter five begins, this is the book of the generations of Adam. And so what <clears throat> how you can trace the promise is by tracing the offspring, the seed. You can almost think of it if you think of it in kind of non-scientific terms, like, you know, by promise, to, to use biblical la language, if like the seed of a seed of the woman, Jesus was already present in the loins of Adam by promise, not obviously not physically, biologically. And then you just have to trace, if you like, the, 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 uh, the passage of that seed through the generations until the time is right. And this is why it's so important that we don't. <coughs> uh, another reason rather why we don't become detached from the Old Testament, even when it's difficult for us to see what the point of it all is for us. Because sometimes the point isn't that you could read that chapter or these chapters or even this verse of the Bible and you get something directly out of it but rather the whole story is the point. And if you don't know the whole story, then you're building what you do know on lots of gaps. And that's not right.
I think we can all agree. So you need to, you need, we need to know the foundations of our faith so that we can fully appreciate them. And if we don't know the foundations, then we don't also fully appreciate the things that we do know. And that's why Genesis 4, the immediate aftermath of the expulsion of Eden, begins with the offspring of Adam and Eve. Okay, so <clears throat> the ESV has retained the old English uh, euphemism. Uh, Adam knew Eve, his wife. When I say it's an English euphemism, it's actually Hebrew euphemism. That's the that's the way that the um, both the Hebrew and the uh, um, and and the Greek translation of it in the Septuagint <coughs> actually uh, express it. The Adam knew Eve, his wife. And just to pause on that word, just a little footnote here. Um, it's not just a euphemism. It's not just a roundabout way of saying something. But it actually says something very, very important about the relationship between a husband and a wife. You know, we had in, in uh, chapter end of chapter two, we had the expression that the uh, man should leave his father's mother. Uh, be united to his wife and they shall become one flesh, which, if you like, expresses the physical significance of the sexual relationship between a husband and a wife. But it's not just a physical act, as we all know. And the most common way of describing it all, all, uh, in the Old Testament is to use that word to know. And I think there's something very helpful, I think, and important about that, <clears throat> that the, the, the physical, the, particularly the sexual relationship between a husband and wife is a matter of mutual knowledge, knowing one another intimately. And if it's not that, then whatever, whatever else is going on, the, re, the way that husband and wife are relating to one another or a man and a woman, indeed, is not the fullness of what God has given. Um, <clears throat> so there are three aspects which the uh, the marriage service uh, also summarizes. There is, you know, for, for the sexual relations between a husband and wife, one is procreation. Uh, one is uh, the kind of uh, mutual uh, it's a kind of mutual giving of one one another one to another physically and all the blessings and, and gifts that come with that and then there's also the the uh not just emotional but even spiritual union of husband and wife which is here called knowledge and all of these i feel like they're different dimensions of that great gift that god has given to husbands and wives and therefore there are you know there are three three they have like three if there are three these di three dimensions there are also therefore three in the three dimensions that that gift can be abused and and misused and broken and husbands and wives do very well to keep that in mind all the time and keep keep those in view so as not to misuse the gift um or to make you know make make use ab abuse one another. Abuse isn't just violence. You can you can also be abusive in in a, a without actually causing physical or even emotional immediate damage, simply by using another person as a means to an end, as as an instrument for yourself. That's just by way of a footnote. I don't know if any anybody wants to respond to or make make any comments on that. Stunned you into uncharacteristic silence. Wow. Um, <clears throat> if not, then uh, so Adam knew his Eve, his wife, and said, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, um, <clears throat> "I have produced a man with the help of the Lord." I think the NIV says, "I have brought forth uh, a man." And uh, I think, what does yours say, Carol? 
gotten. I think, oh, Carol's on the phone. Yeah, it's this thing, gotten, which is um, an, Ameri an Americanism, really, so in archaic English, in, 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 in British English and American expression. But the, the you see that I, with, that I have produced or brought forth a man uh, with the help of the Lord. Um, the Hebrew name is Cain. Cain is Cain. I have produced as Kanithi. So it comes to the word Cain sounds very, it just comes from the same root as the word to produce or to bring forth. So it's it, a common thing in, in the Old Testament is naming of uh, people by circumstances uh, of their conception or their birth. Um, even even Jesus himself, Jesus, the name means the Lord saves. So he's named after his 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 uh, the the circumstances of the, in, the, in his case the cause of his birth. Now, if Eve says, "With the help of the Lord, I have produced a man or brought forth a man." What you what 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 is she saying? What does that mean? I, I have the ESV and it says, I have produced a man with the help of the Lord. And I was just pondering as you, you, you were speaking, it can mean two different things. It's, you know, if you start off with saying, well, I've done this and God's helped, kind of like a PS, by the way, God has helped or the Lord has helped me and I have produced, you know, it's, I was thinking, you know, it is, is Eve kind of just saying that, is this sin saying that God is kind of a, an addition? He's not the central part of me. He's kind of, an, uh, you know, he's helped, but I've done the hard work. Or am I reading too much into it? Well, that's one way of reading it, certainly. <clears throat> so you can see it, okay, this is, this is just God saying, uh, Eve saying, yeah, I, I produced and, and the God helped. I'm reading from the sorry. I'm reading from the New King James, and it says, "I have acquired a man from the Lord." Ah, now that comes mm. comes, comes across very very differently, doesn't it? Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Mine says the same. <clears throat> yeah, acquired, gotten. Uh, see, I think the the um, the emphasis is not on. Who, do, who did that Eve saying that she did all the hard work in the in the sort of original language it's it's more a I mean the um, part of the problem is that English doesn't have uh, a single word for giving birth many languages have this you know word that actually means to give birth to someone whereas in English you say you give birth uh, which is a different same thing. And so, for example, when the Septuagint was translated, the Greek translation, they use that word just for I have I have given birth, which is more a matter of fact. But here we nevertheless have, you know, I, th I, I think it would be to say too much to say that it's all about what I have done and God be my, you know, God was a sidekick here. It is an, an acknowledgement of, of, um, the, the the birth of the son as being a, a you know gift of of god mm, well, I interpret it. um at the same time um she does say or acknowledges really that this life has come from her which it means that the, here we have the first person in the bible who was not a direct creation of God. Adam was created out of the dust of the earth, Eve from the, uh, the, the rib of Adam. But now Cain comes and comes from Eve, the mother of all living. And this is after the fall. So this is her seed, as, as the promise had it, but this is also the seed of her who is under the punishment of God and who in whose body sin dwells. So in that sense, you could say, well, this is now the lineage of Adam and Eve. 
and that explains what happens next. This is not a good creation that might may or may not go wrong. This is procreation from creation already gone wrong. And so we have here not just this seed and the lineage of the seed, but we also have now the consequences that run through generations of Adam and Eve's disobedience. And that's that kind of is what we begin to see. Hence verse 2, we now have, she uh, again, she bore his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of sheep and Cain a worker of the ground. Uh, one possible translation of the name Abel is vanity. Not vanity in the sense of standing in front of a mirror and, and preening yourself, but rather vanity in the sense of things being kind of pointless, like vanity of vanity or vanity. If that is the case, it gives us an interesting insight into how, um, you know, as I said, we, we know nothing about the life of Adam and Eve, but if, if, if that's the correct understanding of the name of Abel, then that gives perhaps gives us an insight into how she's finding life and the 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 joy of bringing bringing forth new life maybe the realization of the reality of death is beginning to hit home you know we give birth to new life and when new birth, new life emerges we know that death already <laughs> has its grip on it Um, go on. I was just going to say, interesting how they came about what they were going to call the sons, um, because you know, kind of, when those of us are having babies now, we kind of go through all these names and decide what we want going to. But obviously, for some reason, as you I think were, were is that the name is very important and it's not a name obviously at the time which other people had but it was a name that de described something about either Eve's feeling about the child or what it looked like or something does that yeah I mean the, the naming customs vary hugely from time to time place to place and culture to culture um, who names and on what basis um, and obviously traditions then develop. So there have been a lot of Eves since then, quite a few Abels. I've never met anybody called Cain uh, for some bizarre reason. <clears throat> but uh, I, I have come across some real life, you know, modern day Abels as well. But uh, these, but yeah. they didn't have anybody else to look at and think about. That's what I'm trying to say. This yeah, no, no, no. And, and, a word that they came up with, which probably they'd never used before. I don't know. I'm just, you know, I've heard or... or... Well, that's an, that's another example of thing that we we kind of we we find it's very difficult for us to bridge the gap between mm. uh, our time and 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 these are prehistoric because these are prehistoric times, mm. um, and and therefore we you know it's 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 not really yeah we 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 can't really access the the uh, the detail. I mean, if if you look at the the length of Adam's life. And then you take to put together all the things, events we know from Adam's life. You could easily squeeze them into a morning. <laughs> you know, uh, so there, there's there's uh, vastly more that we don't know than there is what we do know. <clears throat> um, we do also learn something about, uh, perhaps something about life outside the garden and in, in Adam and Eve's family from the occupation of the two sons. One was a keeper of sheep and the other one uh, a worker of the ground. Uh, this is again, it's um, important to know that the word is the ground as opposed to the earth. Uh, in that it's it's specifically the, the word is 
is is it refers to the soil that the, the the stuff we work in as opposed to some some generic thing about the world so he's a worker of the ground abel is a keeper of sheep now what would you keep sheep for food no. clothing 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 okay so uh the uh, the first evidence of eating meat comes from uh, comes after the fall uh, after the flood when god says to uh noah that uh they can they gives gives him the uh, animals of or certain animals uh, uh as food <clears throat> but of course we have already discovered that uh god had given adam and eve uh clothing uh, from the garments uh, garments of skins uh, of animals mm -hmm. and at some point in history people learned not only to uh, make clothing out of skins but also uh, to make wool uh, which mm -hmm. we don't know when that well I don't know when that was and, and where it fits into this history but there are so there are two occupations here one keeps sheep and the other one works the ground. Now, the working of the ground links back to where? The garden. And more, and yeah, it works and back to the garden. Vegetables and food and stuff. And it specifically worked, again, it's, it's linked to the, uh, the uh, punishment that God issued on Adam, cursing the ground and working, you know, you shall... By the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread till you return to the ground for out of it you were taken. So this working of the ground, which was given as a task of guarding and keeping the <coughs> garden, uh, was then specifically, uh, once the garden was out of bounds, now Adam be became a worker of the ground. <coughs> the ground, however, was cursed. And so both the, both the, if you like, uh, the, uh, the, both the boys' jobs, Abel and Cain, were linked to, already in themselves, to the reality of the presence of sin and the punishment for sin in the world because of sin they needed covering for their body and abel was a keeper of sheep because of sin they needed to work the ground to keep themselves alive Cain <coughs> was a worker of the ground so their their very lives and, and how they now occupied themselves testified to the presence and reality of sin and his punishment uh, on them. And, and there's a certain, I mean, if, if you think of, think of, our, of our, our own lives and our own occupations, isn't that, you know, if you think of all the different things that uh, we have done in our lives, you know, uh, it's not very difficult, it, almost regardless of what, what it is that you've done and, and you know, just in this gathering, we've got lots of different occupations here. But it's not very difficult, I would argue, to take any of your previous or current occupations and say, well, there's a reason for why the job that you did or do exists. And there's a reason, and part of that reason is because <laughs> the world is fallen. So I have been called to preach the gospel. But the gospel needs to be preached because of sin. If there was no sin, there's no need to preach the gospel. We would all know God. Some of you have worked in education and education is needed because of ignorance. Some of you have worked in physical care of people. Well, you only need that if our bodies deteriorate and gradually become defunct some of you have worked in the military services well if there isn't a link between sin and an occupation i don't know if if there's a shorter one than that in a military service where force has to be used to keep order you could take almost anything that you anything that any kind of lawful occupation even those of you who worked in the arts the fact that we kind of uh, you know that that things like i don't know music or other forms of art you know that these these things with 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 which uh, God has beautified our lives, that that you know they, they become things that some some of us kind of had to study and work very very hard to provide for others because we, in a sense, to put it kind of in a sort of semi biblical way, we've kind of lost our song. The Psalms are full of you know, sing to the Lord a new song. Um, 
but you know there's a kind of that we the the beauty needs to be generated for us because it it doesn't come easily and naturally anymore and so there are all these different ways we, which can say that even though what we do is a blessing when we work in lawful occupations and and, and kind of godly callings they're all good things but they are all there they they are needed because of sin and therefore they should always drive us to remembering that sin is there drive us to repentance and also drive us to uh to to seek for ourselves and to promote to others the cure for sin not in just mitigating it by the things that we do but actually cure through the gospel Happily? yes Ed, um just when you read verse two it says abel was a keeper of sheep mm. really what i think was saying is abel was a shepherd of the sheep yeah and that seems to be like uh, a lineage that goes right through the scriptures um you know psalm 23 talking about the lord's being our shepherd and then luke 15 you know the shepherd going out for the lost sheep and so it's just interesting. I was, I was, because I was thinking initially. Thought, why the sheep? I, I think you answered it. Why, why not um, bison? Why not cattle? You know, of all the different species that Adam named, uh, his son was a keeper of the sheep, and yet sheep is so important right through Scripture. The shepherd's so important right through Scripture. Yeah, absolutely, and and you see this then. <laughs> I said, if you see who who are who are the famous shepherds in the Bible, <clears throat> Jesus, Jesus, yes. Yeah. Although he he doesn't actually keep sheep, but he calls himself a good shepherd. What about actual David? David, David. David. David, David. yes. Yeah. Those. <coughs> was it Amos? Was Amos a shepherd? One of the minor prophets? Micah. Micah. Okay. Yes. But of course, you have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and their sons. They were all keepers of sheep, and this is one reason why Jacob's family ended up in Goshen and away from Egyptian settlements because they were shepherds, and the Egyptians despised shepherds. And so, uh, the kind of keeping of sheep, and then, of course, perhaps most famously of all, King David himself, the great shepherd king, says, "The Lord is my shepherd." <coughs> And so the keeping of sheep and, and, and shepherding becomes, you know, from here onwards, becomes a central uh, activity. Yes, Reg? Well, was it essentially sheep? Because my Bible says flocks. So I would have shown, assumed it could have been goats as well. Mm. That's a shepherds. Yeah. The, uh, let me just, uh, well, well, um, I begin to answer. Let me just double check that. But uh, the, I mean, it's it's uh, it's a typical kind of Hebrew Hebrew thing to do, uh, is to um, sort of say things twice. What we call in 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 uh, uh, in, um, in in English would be called a, a, in a tautology. Uh, Let me just, I'm just sort of checking the dictionary here. It's as it's a collective, it can sometimes refer to sheep and goats and sometimes to sheep only. Um, so it could be sheep and goats here. And actually we should say at this point that, you know, the if goats get in, 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 in sort of common Christian understanding, goats often get hard done by. Mm -hmm. We have the, we have the, uh, uh, parable the sheep and the goats and there's a goat. yeah. well, that means the sheep are the goodies and the goats are the baddies yeah. no uh, in, uh, essentially goats were just as valuable as sheep in some things sheep are better you get better more and better wool from sheep mm. and you get more meat and more fat uh, fattier and therefore more filling meat from uh, sheep but goats are hardier they're less likely to die uh, you get a load more milk out of them than you do out of sheep uh, so goats were also very valuable and and the point of the sheep and the goats is not that the sheep sheep are essentially good and goats are essentially bad in the old testament law for example you could have for many of the sacrifices you could offer a sheep or a goat the point is that when you've got sheep and goats at certain times you you want to separate them and it doesn't say 
God separated people. Oh, Jesus separates. I, I separate people from sheep and goats. As I separate nations as a shepherd separates sheep and goats. And and so the, that that's the whole point. So yeah, it could well be uh, sheep and goats and sheep and goats. But again, you know, the chances are that when David was a shepherd, he was also tending sheep and goats. <coughs> that's why you have the word flock. So um, I'm, I'm glad you glad you uh, sharpened our thinking there, Reg. Uh, and you have this, you know, keeping of flocks is is very, uh, very common. The um, um, I, I wonder whether, in a sense, the English history prejudices the English language uh, in that direction a little bit, given the importance of sheep in, in English history for the last at least thousand years, and mm -hmm. goats much less. Um, now. In the course of time, <laughs> it happened. Uh, we're talking about, you know, obviously we're talking about here, you know, years and years have passed between the births of the of the of the boys and and this event. We don't know how many. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought to the first one of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry and his face fell. I don't think we need to have much discussion as to why Cain was angry and why his face fell. Well, he was, he was giving him, he was giving the Lord the stuff that was um, um, not good. Well, the, was, it, um, well, the question is, and it's a million question, yeah. why was it that God didn't accept Cain's offering? Because all it says here is that God had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Canaan's offering, he had no regard. It doesn't say because. We don't know, do we? It doesn't don't tell know. us at all. <clears throat> it, it, you know, it doesn't give us a reason, which means I that there's been a lot of discussion about it. I thought it was that because Abel um, gave the firstborn, and it seemed like Cain just brought some of the fruits, you know, they weren't selected. You've been reading the commentary on Genesis by uh, Kyle and Dealish again, haven't you? <laughs> yes. Uh, I was just reading one of one of the best Old Testament commentaries to my uh, that I know of. And uh, that's the very point that it makes. So you you preempted where I'm leading with this. However, <laughs> sorry, it's going to ignore what you said, Bridge, and look at some oh. of the options. Well, what about the commentary? Up. What about the commentary of Hebrews 11? We'll come to that too. Okay. You're, you're, you're all far too eager. <laughs> okay. Um, now, there, there are various things that have been said about this, and I think it's, it's worth just stopping for a moment to, to consider them. A very common explanation is that is used is that um, because Hebrews elsewhere says there, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins, that the offering of Abel was a bloody sacrifice because blood was shed by killing the killing of the offering, whereas Cain's offering was bloodless. And that's why God didn't have regard for it. There are a couple of problems with that view, and I, I mention it because you might come across it. One problem with that view is that First of all, this is not a sacrifice that is anywhere commanded in Scripture at this point, and it's an offering. So there's no, there's no suggestion that it's, it's some kind of a guilt offering or sin, a sacrifice for sin. It's simply they are bringing an offering to God of the things of that they of we, of which they are in charge, which is an important thing. And it's, it's, it's a part of our worship of God, literally our part of our worship of God, that we bring as an offering to God those uh, a, a, a portion of what he has given to us. It's an acknowledgement that is from him and we return to him what is his own. And it's also acknowledgement that we depend on him. It's an act of faith. It's an act of faith because in that way we, we say, look, I have all this produce all this sheep or all this money or whatever it is um, and I'm going to bring some of it back to you trusting that you will nevertheless be able to care for me 
even without Mr. And that's why the offering is such an important, it's actually a very important part of our worship, whether you know, whether we do it by standing order or whether we whether we put money in envelopes or bring I don't know, loaves of bread and, and fruit and things to church, like the early church, whatever it is that we do. And it was therefore an important part also of the Old Testament, just a second, Rosemary, it was an important part also of the Old Testament sacrifices. So in the Old Testament, we had plenty of offerings that were not of animals and not for sin, but they were offerings of harvest goods, of grain and of, of fruit as well. Rosemary. Well, Cain couldn't have helped what he brought to the Lord because that's what he was looking after and seeing to. He had no choice, did he? Uh, well, he might have. He might have done a little deal with his brother. Say, look, can I can I buy a a, a, a lamb from you for you know for a, a basket of apples and, and and a pound of carrots, uh, so that he can do. I mean, it was theoretically possible. But the issue here isn't. I would I would suggest that the issue here isn't the lack of blood, because there is no suggestion anywhere in Scripture that that was the issue. And there is no command at this point, even though that would have been a clearly visible difference. I think we are, we get much closer to the answer with what you said, Reg, when we look at uh, what it is that they brought. And and it's not that we are we are told what Cain brought, but we are told what Cain did. And and sorry, we're not told what Cain brought, but we're told what Abel brought. And then we look for the corresponding phrase in Cain and find it missing. Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. So Reg, say again what you said earlier. Well, I thought it was because Abel brought the firstborn of his flock and Cain Looking at my Bible, said um, brought some of the fruit of the earth, you know, as if it, as if it wasn't selected, you know. I'll just pick these up and let it do. Right. So that that's, mm. I think, I think there's something very important that's going on here. There's a key, look at the detail of what Abel brought. He doesn't say Abel brought some of his flock. He says of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. Now, there is a little bit of discussion among scholars as to how we should read the fat portions, because it's a kind of, it's a, it's a very generic sort of statement. In Later in the Levitical law, there's a very clear command that all the fatty parts belong to the Lord. Now, you know, we, we live in a, in a, in a, a more prosperous than is good for us kind of uh, society, uh, where we all try to eat lean, and stay lean because otherwise, and so we stay away from fat. But if you're living a nomadic lifestyle, for example, then eating fat is actually very, very important uh, because that's obviously is where you get a lot of your energy from. I mean, I, I don't know when you last ate uh, whale blubber, but it's it's there's a reason why amongst the indigenous population of the Arctic Circle, that's considered to be uh, a bit of a, 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 a treat because you need all the calories you can get. And so <clears throat> when you're sacrificing to the Lord, God said, all the fatty parts are mine. Which is to say that the, the most valuable, the most precious bit is mine. Now, there is no suggestion, as I said, that this is, a, this is in response to a command of the Lord. They, they are bringing the offerings. Uh, but either it's saying here that he brought the first born and their fat portion their fat portion so all the bits that are kind of dedicated to the lord or it could actually mean also that what he brought in he brought the firstborn and specifically the ones that had been fattened either kind of the the the, the prize uh in kind of the, the the show animals you know you, you have the fatted calf later on as as becomes a thing you know that you would have one that you would you would have a calf or a lamb that you deliberately kind of indulged they grew really fat and, and 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 then when you slaughtered that you got a really particularly delicious and nutritious meal and that's the other possibility here that is able kind of pick the the choice members of the flock 
the ones that you would want for yourself. And those are the ones that he sacrificed the Lord. Whichever it is, the end result is the same. He brought the best. And he brought the firstborn. And of course, there is there is a tremendous act of faith in bringing the firstborn. What is that? Why is that an act of faith? Because that's the most important one first. Because yeah, why is most firstborn? Important? Because Jesus was the firstborn. Uh, but just in the person, I'm thinking purely in agricultural terms. You, you don't know there's going to be a second. Exactly. Who knows that the wolf isn't, you know, the fox or something isn't, isn't going to get the mother tomorrow. And that's it. Hmm. And that's why, you know, when God calls for the first fruits, Israel to give their first fruits. Or when he says that the firstborn, the, the male that opens the womb is mine. The firstborn belongs to the Lord and you don't keep it for yourself. You either bring it to the sanctuary or if you don't you break its neck or you don't get to keep it it belongs to the lord god is calling israel by giving that command to remember her dependence on god and that's why i mean christians are not commanded specifically how we ought to give there is no percentage that we've been given, although I always recommend, if you're able, uh, to, to to default to tithing. It, it makes math really easy, easy to work out how much you ought to give. But it also it's 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 big enough for you to have to consider your budget. So it makes a difference, but hopefully not so big that it leaves you in penury. And because it's a percentage rather than a fixed sum, it also therefore means that it's it. It's, it's re relative to your income. But the, the principle, and again, we're not told which bit of our, uh, our, our food and drink and our income we should give. But I very strongly urge you to engage in this able, like giving of the first fruits, i.e. you give off the top rather than the bottom. You don't give to the church whatever is left at the end of the month once you've had your your takeaway curries and your uh, and your uh, whatever it is TV subscriptions and 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 paid for your 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 holiday and for your uh, I don't know your your home massa massage and all the other things that we kind of with which we on which I'm sure you spend all your money all the time especially the massage but you know that and then oh well, there's a bit of money left over and so I'll give that to the church no that's simply saying well god can have whatever's you know what i don't need that can go to god that's not an that's it's not that god needs your money all of the poor do uh, and and the church does but it's really detrimental to your own faith if you consider that all that that your number one priority is to have the things that you want and then the rest whatever's left over goes to god because then you are placing your own pleasure and your own desires at the center of your life. And, you know, your flesh does that naturally. It doesn't need any encouragement at all. And, you, you know, we all need to fight against the temptation to prioritize earthly things that give us pleasure over the things of God, especially when it's hard. And this is why, again, sacrificial giving, both in the sense of giving, you know, you set your budget and you set your budget in the first thing you set in your budget is because this is what this is uh you know you 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 set your budget for the things that you can't do without and one of those is the gospel and that goes right at the top and then you see at the end well how much money does that leave uh for my love of lollipops or belgian chocolates or whatever it is and that way because and this is what takes us to hebrews Notice here the order in which the commentary goes. It doesn't say that Lord had regard for Abel's offering, but not for Cain's offering. It says the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. The 
key issue is the offerer, not the offering. Paul writes to the Romans, uh, end of Romans chapter 14, says, uh, whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. Just this morning, I was uh, reading um, Proverbs, as in, as some of you might recall, I've, and I, I've, I've recommended this to you and to many others as well, of reading a chapter of Proverbs every day. And if you just follow the days of the month, then today is chapter 28. And I don't know if any of you did that today. But verse 9 says this, If one turns away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer is an abomination. If you turn your ear away from hearing God's law, even your prayer is an abomination. It's not that what we do makes us righteous before God. But rather, if we are righteous, then what we do by, in faith is righteous. But if we are unrighteous, even those things that seem righteous things become unrighteous. Or as Jesus puts it very, very memorably, that it's out of the heart what comes out of the heart is what makes us unclean, not what goes into the mouth. Food can't make you unclean. You are unclean from within. And then when you do things with an unclean heart, then everything you touch is becomes unclean, even your seemingly righteous acts, your prayers and your sacrifice and offerings. So, David, we come back to you. What is the commentary in Hebrews? On you read it have you got you it there? Read it? Yes, please. Sorry. <clears throat> um, verse four. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, was, uh, though he died, he still speaks. Thank you. Yeah. So this is cha Hebrews chapter 11, verse four. If you make notes in the margin of your Bible and you haven't got this one, it's a good one to add. Hebrews 11, verse 4. By faith, Abel offered a better sacrifice, and that's what made it righteous to God. Now, how can we know, other than that the writer to the Hebrews tells us, how does the writer to the Hebrews know that it was by faith that Abel offered his, offered, offered, made his offering as opposed to Cain? And the answer is what we've just said. We see it from what he offers, that he's acting in faith. So what he offers is acceptable because of his faith, but his faith is demonstrated by the thing that he offers. And that teaches us something very important also, um, which is that our deeds do not make us righteous. They do not. Our righteousness is by faith, as scripture uniformly teaches. But the deeds of the righteous are the deeds of the righteous as opposed to the unrighteous. When we act in faith, that true faith produces righteous deeds. If you trust God, you will act differently from the person who does not trust God. If you believe that you are a sinner deserving damnation, but that your sins are made clean in the blood of Christ and that he has called you to live in his kingdom under his in his righteousness. Starting now. That will change the way that you live your life from if you believe that either that you're good or you don't need to repent or that you are a damn sinner who has no hope. Your deeds don't make you righteous, but your righteousness changes the way that you, you know, changes your deeds. And so Abel had faith. And how can we tell that faith? Because we see how he, what he did. And the implication is that Cain just cobbled together some of what he did, some of what he had. But there is nothing here to suggest. It's not, it's, we're not told that it's the first fruits or the most precious crop. It's just some of the produce. And so he calls us to read this, to calls us to examine ourselves and our lives 
you know, there's that old thing which can be terribly abused in illegalistic fashion. Said, if you were put on trial for the crime of being a Christian, would you would they find sufficient evidence to condemn you? Um, <laughs> Which I, <laughs> and I, I don't particularly like that. Usually that's, that, that question is asked to send people on a guilt trip. But there is, a, there is nevertheless, and I don't want anyone to go on, on, on that guilt trip, but nevertheless, um, there is a very clear connection in Scripture between faith and works. Faith leads to works, certain kinds of works, and produces certain kinds of works. Now, to the outsider... You see the works first, if you like. Not the faith, but the faith is actually the thing that produced the works. That means that if you examine your own life and your own works, and they're not particularly able-like, and they're more Cain-like, what is it that you need? More faith. More faith. And that faith is born by hearing the promises grasping those promises and then putting them to practice so faith comes by hearing the word of christ contemplating the promises of god but it also because faith leads to life lived differently then what one way that we grow our faith is that we exercise it we put it to practice that's what abraham did you know abraham believed god and then God said to test his faith and scripture specifically tells us that it was to test his faith. They said, OK, give you know, kill, you know, sacrifice your son for me. And Abraham didn't say, I already trust in you, God, I don't need to do that. No, he put his faith to practice. By exercising it, even when it seemed contrary to all possibility of fulfillment. And by that, his faith was strengthened. And in the same way, when we act in faith, I mean, what does it mean to live our lives by faith? Well, it means obviously to trust in God's promise of forgiveness and therefore to live in hope. It means that we repent daily of our sins and we trust that when God says that's bad, we say, OK, that, therefore that is bad or that you need more of this. Then we say, OK, I trust you, God, and we pursue this that we need more of. But also to live in obedience to God's commands is an act of faith. Because to live in obedience, you know, the only reason we don't believe, uh, live in accordance with God's commands is because we don't actually believe that they are good and true. I mean, if, if I believed in all situations that vengeance is the Lord's and therefore I should, if I see my enemy, I should just give him, you know, thirsty, I should give him water and if he's naked, give him clothes because vengeance is the Lord's, then I would never be, even be tempted to take vengeance, either in my mind or in, or, in, or in actual practice, on my enemy. Why would I want to do that? Because I don't actually fully trust that it's true. When God says that he's judged just and he will not let his justice to be delayed, if I actually believe that, I wouldn't be so tempted to take justice into my own hands. Or when my mind or my body tempt me to a particular sin to which for which I have a propensity. If I really trusted God, I said, I, and then I would know not to trust the call of the temptation. I said, no, that's just, you know, that's a complete lie. That's not pleasure. You think it's pleasure. It's not. So why do I disobey God? Because I don't trust him. And so faith and works, they, they have to put in the right order. There is no righteous works without faith but faith produces righteous works and we exercise that faith by he hearing and heeding and entrusting ourselves to the promises and then to use a terrible cliche that i actually dislike but it, it just is it, is we step out in faith in other words we, we said okay now god i trust you he says jump and i'll catch you we just jump Go this way, my, my son, and not that way. And we follow where he leads. And so the exercise of obedience to God's command is an exercise of faith if we do it out of faith. Not in order to become righteous, but because we're to, okay, I've been called to righteousness. I better pursue righteousness.
God has made me holy, so I'd better try, you know, do my utmost to live a life of holiness, trusting that this is the noblest calling, regardless of whatever what other voices there are. I, I don't know if that's if, if that makes sense. I mean, it's e very very easy to get these things confused, and become either slack in our sanctification or to become legalistic and say, so okay, I must make myself acceptable to God. David. Yeah. Um, yes, I agree with all you've said. It's just in, in practical life, you know, when you, you're walking through each day, our minds can be all over the place. And sometimes I say to Cynthia, sometimes you can get a, a thought in from the left, you know, it just kind of knocks you. And then um, you start to analyze, examine before you know it, you're kind of it's introspection. You're looking at your belly button. You think, have I done right or have I done, not done right? And so I just kind of think, um, ultimately, we want assurance that we're right with God. And our problem is some Christians tell you that you've got to really focus on, are you producing good works? And then you realize, my goodness, it's a minefield out there. I'm, I think I'm producing some good works, but there's a lot of rubbish happening in my life. And then what I noticed, what I really liked about Lutheran th uh, theology, you know, what Luther preached was, you got to keep on, yes, you can't deny good works, it's important, but your salvation, your assurance is outside of yourself on Christ crucified. And I found what's really helped me in my journey has been, um, there's been good stuff happening in my life and there's been very bad stuff happening in my life, but I keep on looking to Christ crucified that's my starting point. And as I look to him, as I receive forgiveness from him, then there's a change happening in my life day by day. It may not be dramatic, but then I begin to discover, yep, yeah, I can start loving my neighbor in a different way, thinking in a different way. So it's what I'm trying to say is sometimes our minds can play games on us. And it's, it's difficult to take what you've said, which I agree with totally, and live it out day by day because often we that's why i think we need to hear the gospel every day mm. yeah. we do yeah it's, and it is it's 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 not just the foundation of everything but it's the core of everything you know we never it's like you know you're saying you know if you think of foundation you know foundation of a house there is no foundation no house at all so you have to be constantly be established established on on a solid ground on the solid rock and the solid rock is christ and what he has done for us but then out of that comes out the fruit of righteousness it is the fruit of righteousness and christ talks about us being branches to himself and we must stay uh grafted onto him in order to produce fruit there is no other fruit that you know a individual cut off branches do not produce fruit and so if you find that your life is not particularly fruitful, then the answer, the first answer is, and the ultimate answer is, draw nearer to Jesus. Draw nearer to the gospel. Hear the promises again. Be assured and strengthen your faith. And then do the math, as, as, as they say. You know, working, so, so, so what? And if this is the case, then what? So the New Testament says things like, you know, in the, in the letters of Paul, you know, Therefore, set your mind on the things that are above and the life that comes from that. What sort of life should we live given that? Letter to the Hebrews itself is an encouragement to perseverance and then said, okay, that if, if, if these promises are true, then there are certain consequences that flow from that. And, and here are some of them. And that's, that's exactly how it works. So our Christian pursuit of righteousness, our, our seeking after obedience to god's will is must always be as a result of who we are in christ not a stepping stone to becoming something and either way if we say what i do doesn't matter because i'm forgiven in christ then i don't understand what it means to be forgiven it means to be removed from the power of sin and not to be not not liberty to sin more you know read romans 6 <laughs> On the other hand, if I, you know, if I say what I do is absolutely essential to my being a Christian, if I if I sin, then that shows that I'm not a Christian. That also 
it's a denial of the gospel because they are saying actually what Christ has done for me and has made of me is not sufficient. I must add to it. And it's a very fine point. And the thing with fine points is that they're easy to, easier to fall off than to stay on. And therefore, we must always be, you know, constantly be returning to the biblical way of thinking, constantly seeking from scriptures, uh, um, if like a, a strengthening in our faith, so we understand what it is that our faith is built on. You know, like what does this hymn say? Uh, my hope is built on nothing less but than yeah. Jesus' blood and righteousness. <clears throat> And then constantly said, okay, so what does this mean? This is one reason, by the way, if I, if I, if I may uh, advertise uh, something, a product again, one reason why uh, we all do well to return to the catechism regularly, because it sets this out so very, very clearly all the time. You know, what is the, what does such baptizing with water signify? It signifies that the old Adam in Ashupa daily remorse and repentance be daily drowned and die, and a new person should come forth and rise to live before God in righteousness and purity forever. That's what it means to be baptized. The old Adam must die daily. The new person emerges daily. Okay. So. There's a, you know, it's only only a verse, a couple of verses in passing, but there's a lot of basic, you know, this this is the thing with these early chapters of Genesis. It's one reason why we go so slowly. I hope you've been patient with the pace, but there's so much of it that it, it kind of, the, there are these germs of biblical teachings that are ultimately kind of gradually, um, uh, if you like, they, they germinate and, and come to full blossom later in scripture. Is there anything else on, on, on these verses? Uh, on on the um, if you like the prelude to the tragedy L let's look at then uh what happens uh next so this is from verse uh six uh let's go from verse 6 to 16 i don't think we'll finish verse 16 today but let's read it anyway all the way because it's it's one unit and then come back uh cover as much as we've got time for so who'd like to read verses 6 to 16 i can read it thank you cynthia so the lord said to cain why are you angry and why has your countenance fallen if you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door. And as desire is for you, but you should rule over it. Now Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. So now you are cursed from the earth, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. A fugitive and a vagabond you shall be on the earth. And Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Surely you have driven me out <clears throat> this day from the face of the ground, I shall be hidden from your face. I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond on the earth, and it will happen that anyone who finds me will kill me. And the Lord said to him, Therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark on Cain, lest anyone finding him should kill him. Then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord, and dwelt in the land of Nod, on the east of Eden. Thank you. Any uh, initial thoughts, questions? How can they bring forth more children if one's dead and the other one's out in the world doing, trying to keep from being killed? How do you mean, sorry? Well, Cain must produce children because at the moment, they're the only children from Adam and Eve, and it's supposed to... Yeah, the answer to that is wait and see. That's All of that is answered in the second half, the, in the verses that follow what we just read. 
quo. <laughs> okay, well, if if you haven't got any any anything um, at, that jumps out at the moment, let's let's have a look then what we see. So the Lord said to Cain, "Now we are not told before you even ask. We're not told how it is that God communicates with Cain." Um, and since we are not told, we don't know. Is this is, is this a, like uh, a kind of a, a if you like a a lively way of describing the process of Cain's own conscience? As some people have suggested, does he actually hear a voice from heaven? Did the early earliest people did they if like communicate more immediately with God than we do? We are simply not told, but we do say no that the Lord did speak to Cain, and. How would you summarize this whole message from God? Why are you angry? Why is your face full? Now, why, why are you upset? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, since crouching at the door is desire is for you, but you must rule over it. How would you summarize that or rephrase that? Interesting how God comes in asking questions. But like with Adam and Eve, originally, you know, where are you? And now he's asking, you know, why? Um, why, why are you angry? Um, yeah. Yeah. So he comes the same, gives him, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's certainly like a, he doesn't come accusing. But gives no, it's as, if he, it's as if he leaves the door open. Yeah. Very good. Uh, Carol. Yeah, I was just saying, why are you surprised by this when what you've given me is not necessarily what you should be giving me? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's the thing. If you do well, will you not be accepted? Um, there's a, a, like a, a bookend of the Old Testament. At the end of the Old Testament, you've got the book of Malachi. And one yeah. of the things that uh, Prophet Malachi, the, the God, you know, God is angry with the priests of Israel is that they're bringing blemished animals for sacrifices. Sounds sort of familiar. Mm -hmm. And one of the kind of questions that God asks is, you know, you know, if you if you try to give a gift like that to your governor, will he will he accept it? You know, if you go to your kind of earthly superiors and try to give them a gift, which is obviously, you know, like a, you know, if you if you if you go and say, you know, give give to the queen your worn out jumper with holes in the elbows. And said, "Happy birthday, my 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 sovereign lady. Will she be impressed?" And yet we try this with God all the time, <laughs> and that's kind of yeah. So if you do well, he's killing him. And I, I, it seems to me that God is giving Cain ample opportunity for repentance, for self-reflection and repentance, and a warning. If you don't do well, sin is crouching at the door. And this is the thing, you know, we, we think that we are so very much in control of ourselves. You know, his desire is for you, but you must rule over it. Um, Luther makes a point when he is lecturing on, on Genesis 4, he says, you know, it says that you must rule over it. Doesn't mean that God is saying that you are able to rule over it. <laughs> it means you should. Doesn't mean that you can. Mm -hmm. And... And, and, so, and so the warning is, is not to play with sin and not to take matters of faith lightly because we are forever, you know, this, this, this I mean, if you think of this and if, you, if you're living in, an, in, sort of in the ancient world and you're living in a tent and you had this, you know, something's crouching at the door, what is the something going to be in, in norm, normally in real life? Devil. Now, I don't, I, don't, I don't mean spiritually, I mean actually, in, in kind of in, in the physical world. Some Bear. Sort of danger. Yeah, it's, it's, it's some sort of an animal. It's a crouching at the door and it's not likely to be your pussycat. You know, the, the, there are, I can't remember, I think, I'm trying to off the top of my head to remember, I think 12 different words for lion in Hebrew. You know, and if you've got 12 different words for lion, that means that they, they, they were a bit of a preoccupation for people. <laughs> You know, sin is crouching at the door. It's waiting to pounce. It's waiting for the opportunity. I think you've all seen enough BBC Nature documentaries to know what that looks like. Don't mm. mess with it. If you do well, you will be accepted. If not, sin is crouching at the door. 
it's desire is for you sin is you know sin is throughout scriptures personified it's not just a it's not a it's not just a word collective term for but naughty things but it's, it's, it's described very often for saint paul does it in his letters talks of sin as a this sort of cosmic power that is trying to master us to which we are slave you know the other way you could think of this crouching is you know this like you know if you think of the image of slavery to sin in romans 6 for example um I don't know if, if any of you read or watched the TV series when it came out, uh, Roots by Alex Haley. Um, I read that a couple of years ago. And, and in the whole description, you know, the boy goes out, you know, on a carefree sword somewhere. And because he's not paying attention, next thing he knows, he's pounced on and he, and he finds himself enslaved. And by that time, it's too late. And you can spend all your time on the on the crossing of the Atlantic in the slave market and you know the rest of your miserable life you can think if only I had been more vigilant too late and this is the image that scripture uses of sin and therefore we're called to what does Jesus say stay awake be vigilant be watchful and what we must be watching for is not just kind of spiritual thoughts and ideas but sin, unfaithfulness and lack of faith in our whole lives and not to make little deals with the devil. I mean, folklore in all countries is full of stories of people who kind of made a deal with the devil. What do they all have in common? Wanting better for themselves. And the end result? Death. <laughs> yeah, it, <didn't laughs> go well. it, it never goes well. No, it all goes wrong. Yeah, it goes there. There are all sorts of variations, but it's always the same. You do a deal with the devil and it never pays off. You're worse off in the end than you were before you began. And what does Cain do? He runs away, sort of. He kills his brother. Kills his so brother what does first. he do to God's words? Oh. Ignores them. Ignores them. Yes, yeah. Yeah, Cain's... <laughs> Cain spoke, so God spoke to Cain. Cain doesn't reply. Mm. Cain doesn't get does the talking now, and he's the elder brother. Spoke to Abel, his brother. Now, some Bible translations say, and the NIV does this, I've got a translation of the Bible into Finnish as well. Um, and the this is already in the Septuagint, which is this second century Greek translation of the old testament second century bc greek translation cain said to his brother abel let us go out to the field the hebrew the original text doesn't say what he said we infer that kind of let's blah 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 is an inf inference from the fact that cain spoke to abel and what happened it just says cain spoke to abel his brother and when they were in the field cain rose up against his brother abel and killed him who did Cain have a problem with? God. In God, yes. Cain's quarrel was with God. Because it was to him that he made his offering. It was God who didn't accept it. And Cain, instead of dealing with the problem of sorting his relation with God out, decided to take a different shortcut and acted against Abel. It was simply a crime of envy. Cain, Abel wasn't a party to the quarrel. Now there was Cain with God and there's Abel with God and Abel was accepted by God. Cain was not accepted by God, but it had nothing to do with each other. But it was jealousy, wasn't it? He was jealous of God's relationship with Abel and Abel's relationship with God. And instead of accepting God's discipline and amending his ways repenting he decided instead to destroy abel who had nothing to do with it instead of emulating abel he destroyed abel and luther i think is very very famously and and i think very helpfully kind of goes off at this point he's, he's lecturing on this text and he kind of goes off on a tangent and said that it was ever thus the whole history of God's people is the battle between the church of Cain and the church of Abel. Those whose righteousness is in, in God's promise alone and those who are self-righteous. And the church of Cain is forever trying to destroy the church of 
able. Now, Luther in his day, of course, had very strongly, uh, very um, firmly and clearly in mind his own present struggles where the Church of Rome and papacy was trying to destroy the Church of the Reformation and trying to impose a righteousness of works over the righteousness of faith. So there is another thing. Now in our day, it's the Pope and his cardinals who are the Church of Canaan trying to kill the Church of Abel. But the whole history, and you see this, you know, you see this David and Saul, Jacob and Esau, you know, wherever you go in the scripture, you've always got this struggle, Judah and Israel, of the two alternative paths to uh, God's acceptance. And what they have in common always is that the unrighteous one is forever not trying to become more righteous, but rather trying to destroy the righteous. In interesting as well, that Cain, in a way, has broken all the commandments uh, at once. You know, he, he doesn't love God with all his heart and his closest, closest neighbor, who is his brother, mm. um, he kills. So he certainly doesn't love his neighbor as himself. No, and you kind of, and this is again, you know, James in his letter says, if you've broken law in one place, you've broken the whole law because one God has given the whole law. And, but not only that, but how, well, if I quote Luther again from the large catechism, uh, his, his most marvelous explanation of the first commandment, if you haven't read it or haven't read it recently, I really commend it to you. The explanation of the first commandment in the large catechism is just pure gold. But he speaks of the first commandment being, you know, he said if, if the commandments are like a necklace of beads, the first commandment is, is the thread that holds them all together. Cain's problem is that he doesn't love God. And because he doesn't love God, nothing else works either. And therefore he sees his brother's righteousness not as a cause of thanksgiving or even an example to follow, but a threat. Because Abel's righteousness is an accusation against his own unrighteousness. I mean, some, have you ever wondered why, for example, why some you know organizations, or to use a term very loose, like ISIS, why are they so busy trying to shoot and bomb people and enslave them and crucify them and behead them and all those other things, you know, burn them, burn them alive and all? So why, why, why are they doing that? Why don't they just be so think, you know, if God's on our side? And this is God's will. So, you know, we're going to be victorious. Why do we have to torture and crucify and enslave our opponents or those who we see as opponents? What's what, you know, what, what's the mindset? It's supposed to be in the Quran, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> you, although I think most Muslims would say that they, they're not reading Quran very well. <laughs> Well, they don't believe or trust that that is the case, that God is in, in control and that they can trust him. They want to do it for themselves. Well, so it They're seems frightened. to me. Yes, exactly. I think, you know, it's whenever you've got dictatorships, you know, it doesn't matter whether it's Hitler or Stalin or Mussolini or somebody else, what you see is that they always act in fear. Yeah. And everybody's frightened of the powerful dictators and the, and the, and the tyrannical terrorists or whatever. But people act like that because they themselves are fearful. If you are fully confident that this is God's way and we are going to win this, that there's no, you know, history is on our side and God's on our side, you know, you don't really care. You know, people oppose it, poof, you're going to be, you know, you're going to be run over by, by God himself. Remember Gamal Gamaliel's advice, you know, uh, council when the disciples were before the council in Jerusalem. If this thing is from God, yeah, you can't if the thing is not from God, it will not last. Yeah. If it is from God, there's nothing you can do against it. Yeah. And Cain is the first one here. He says, you know, God, he acts in anger, and you can see that you know he has his brother as an example. Note the younger brother. And with this is another. It's very difficult to teach this Bible study because I just want to stop at every point and you know uh, <laughs> go off on all these tangents. But the younger brother is said, okay, here's an example of righteousness. His was accepted. Yours wasn't. Learn from him. And he doesn't. While we're talking about younger brothers, can you think of any in the Bible, any significant younger brothers? David. David. Again. Joseph. 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 Benjamin. Yeah. Prodigal son. Prodigal son. Yes, very good. Jacob. How about Isaac? Jesus? 
Isaac was an only, only child, although he was the younger brother to Ishmael, half-brother to Ishmael, that's true. Joseph, did we say Joseph? Yeah, we did. Okay. How about Jesus? Who is Jesus? The only he's, son of God. He's the only son of God, but he's also... He'd be the oldest son of Mary. Yes. In what sense, let me ask, re ask you this way to be really clear. In what sense is Jesus not th the younger son? <clears throat> well, he'd be younger than his father. <laughs> that doesn't make him younger son. Oh. <laughs> I can see lots of puzzled faces staring at me through my screen. Yeah, no. He's the second Adam. Thank you. He's the second oh, Adam. Right. Mm. You look at the uh, you look at the genealogy of Jesus in Luke's gospel. Jesus, the son, as he was supposed to, of Joseph, son of son of son of son of son of Adam, son of God. He's the second Adam. What mm. the first Adam came to do and failed, the second Adam came to do and succeeded, and so on. Mm. And this of and and throughout the scripture, God chooses the unlikely, the weaker, the younger, the one who has no natural claim. Jacob rece receives the blessing of the firstborn, though he's not the firstborn. Joseph becomes the master of his brothers, although he's the younger one. Mm. And so on. David is the youngest of these eight brothers, and yet he becomes king. Mm. Even though Saul is the one who's handsome and taller than Overbeard, and so on and so on and so on. Saul himself is taken from the tribe of Benjamin, which is the least of the tribes and the young, you know, the littlest of the younger brother, and so on. This is how God works. He takes the weak so that he may demonstrate his strength. He takes the one who has no natural claim so that all their claim can be in God alone. And there'd be a whole Bible study in that, but we will move on. We've got a few minutes left. Cain doesn't love or trust God, and therefore the whole of you know the whole commandment of God is broken, and he rose, he ignores God, and he rises up and he kills Abel. And God comes to Cain as he had come to Adam and Eve after their sin and says, where is Abel, your brother? He doesn't come accusing him. Mean, just think of the mercy and love of God. You know, what has Cain done? Think of what Cain has done. Think of your own family members. You know, you're, you're, you know, he's killed his own. He's got their two brothers and one has killed the other. And God doesn't come a blazing with wrath and anger and thundering at him. He says, he asks him a question. Where's Abel, your brother? Gives him an opportunity. The first thing that he gives, his first response is say, confess your sin. Confess your sin. His door of mercy is already open at this point. I mean, it's, it's, it's just, I mean, it, it's just extraordinary that God should do such a thing. And yet he does. When Adam and Eve were first confronted by God, when God said to Adam, where are you? Not where is your brother, where are you? What did Adam do? He hid. No, he had already hidden. He was hiding and God said, where are you? What did Adam's, what, what was Adam's response? Yeah. He was, he was afraid. He's explained why he said, I hid myself because I was naked. I was afraid. Hmm. Essentially, he, although he didn't confess his deed, he confessed, if you like, his state. Hmm. It was a sort of half confession. When God asked further questions, he then, they then tried to pass the buck to each other and he tried to pass the buck. But he didn't deny his deeds. He said, I did do it, but it wasn't really my fault. And you can see here, now we have Cain, who, whom Eve produced with the help of the Lord. And his first response, there's no fear of God here. He lies. Mm. He defies God. He says, I don't know. Why are you asking me? I mean, if, you know, if, if that was a four-year-old child, they end up on the naughty step, right? Or... A few decades ago something a bit more painful yeah. <laughs> yeah so you don't speak to your parents like that and you certainly don't speak to god like that 
why are you asking me now just to just to clarify something i have to double check this the it says abel was a keeper of sheep and here it says my brother's keeper that's a complete coincidence though there, there's no correspondence in in hebrew between them it's it really it would be almost better to say am i my brother's guardian the one who cares for in fact <clears throat> this is the keeper of brother comes from the same word that is used for adam's task in the garden to keep the garden to guard it um so am i you know am i my brother's guardian now what's the correct answer to that question is cain his brother's guardian or keeper in that sense no sorry when i say guardian i don't mean legal guardian the one who's responsible for his kind of um, uh, in that sense but rather the one who guards and cares and looks after and, and protects well, yes, he's he's, he's a younger younger brother he is his younger brother and in yeah, fact we're all called to be each other's guardians yeah what what else does it mean to love your neighbor as yourself than to care for him i mean look at look at the good samaritan the good samaritan could have come to the the man on the road and said look you know am i am i, am I the strangest guardian surely not somebody else's problem or somebody else's child not mine to love your neighbor as yourself is to be the guardian of your neighbor and who else i mean when he said who is my neighbor there's always that question who's my neighbor and jesus says any whoever needs you but before you even ask that god has placed into each of our lives certain people who are undeniably our neighbors beginning with our immediate family mm -hmm. You know, if you have to love your neighbor as yourself, that begins by being, you know, loving your spouse, loving your parents, loving your children, loving your siblings, and so on. Am I my brother's keeper? Yes, you are, Cain. Very much so. But so you can see that the corruption and the degradation of mankind beginning, that already the son is worse than the parents. When confronted by God, He's completely defiant and full of lies. I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? And he shuts the door. Remember when it says, you know, sin is crouching at the door. Well, God comes to the door and instead of offering mastery, he's offering repentance. And Cain slams the door on repentance. And now God stops asking questions and making offers. And he comes the accusation. What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. But at this point, we kind of start a whole new line of thought, which I su suggest we'd be better off doing in one sitting rather than breaking halfway through. So this is a good place to stop at the end of verse. Now we'll carry on from verse 10 uh, next time. And that leaves us a couple of minutes for any, any com conversation, any discussion, uh, any questions on what we have looked at or anything that we haven't touched on that you would like to have. The word guardian, sorry, could you open that up a little bit? There's something in my head. Is it in Hebrews where it says we have a guardian angel? Um, if that's the case, what does it mean to guard our neighbor? And does God, does God guard us through angels? Uh, there is ministering, a, ministering angel actually it was a ministering, yeah, ministering angel. angel that's just, yeah. that means serving yeah uh the the phrase guardian angel doesn't occur in the in no, the you're bible right. there is an ezekiel this phrase guardian cherub which is the the king of tyre uh, yeah. uh but that's that's as a, by the by it, it comes from the word to to uh to guard or to protect that's the 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 key meaning the kind of central meaning of it. you're guarding or protecting something mm -hmm. and so the guardian is the one who protects or guards something and so was am i my brother's guardian my brother's keeper is it, is it my job to protect my brother to to look after him to to shield him from danger yeah um and the, the greek word uh gives is is the um uh the greek verb to guard is is philosopher which gives us words like prophylactic 
a prophylactic is a medicine you take in advance to protect you in advance of some things. If you're going to malaria, you know, country infect, infested with malaria, you take an anti-malarial prophylactic so that when you go there, you already have protection against malaria. That's the kind of, that's the key sense of it. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm just trying to think, I, I, you know, I have an older brother and I just kind of think practically, well, how can I guard my brother? He's mature adult, and yet um, I can guard him in terms of reputation, um, well-being, those type of things. I'm just trying to think of practically, how do you guard someone in, in your family? I can understand guarding a grandchild. You know, you'd, you'd, you'd die for your grandchild, but how far does that apply to siblings and parents and things like that? I think the short answer to that is is because we, I don't think we want to engage too much because it's true. But the short answer is to say, <clears throat> uh, and, and it sounds like a cop out, but it's not really. Insofar as is appropriate in that relationship, and insofar as you can. So when you're dealing with adults, you know, independent adults in an independent adult relationships, it's not your job to monitor his bank account. And or, or his or his uh, bedtime or any, things like that, but insofar as you are able, the be the welfare of your neighbour is your business. Yeah. So if you know, let's take a complete hypothetical example. But you hear that your your brother is about to invest his life savings into some great scheme that you, you know, and you have knowledge that this is this is this is going to be absolute disaster. Then, if you care for your brother, you will say, look. I've, I've looked into this and I, you really shouldn't do that because it's going to cost you rather than saying, oh, he's an adult, he can do whatever he likes. Um, mm. Just use this a trivial, trivial and imaginary example. So there isn't a kind of simple answer, you know, look, here's a table of if this is your relationship, then these are your responsibilities. But rather, it's, it's, it's more of an attitude of my neighbor's welfare is my business. Insofar as I'm, I'm able to care for it. Anybody else? We've got uh, one minute left, literally. Well, in the face of the resounding silence, let's stop there. Let's close with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the example, the warning and the promises of your word. We thank you that you confront our sin with the call to repentance rather than with your naked and fearful wrath and we beg you that your holy spirit will soften our hearts break down our prideful resistance that when you call us to repentance we would heed your call bring our sins in confession before you and entrust ourselves to the, your mercy and love in, in your son jesus christ and his precious blood and sacrifice for us and we ask that you would fill our hearts with the gifts of your Holy Spirit, that our whole lives would be a demonstration of your love and that we would spend our days gladly serving in the world and in your kingdom with the gifts that you have given to us. Keep us and the whole church throughout the world until Jesus comes to gather us home to your kingdom of glory. So may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. Amen.